Acts chapter 28, and uh, we're only going to be in one particular passage today, and in Acts 28 is where we're going to be, and I'd ask if you just keep your uh, Bible open to that, and, and then also notice we'll have some notes for you to follow along in the message here today. Acts chapter 28, and I would like to preach a message this morning titled, How to Shake Off the Vipers. How to Shake Off the Vipers. Acts chapter 28, and uh, let's start reading in verse number 1, and then I'd ask you to pray with me. Notice if you would, verse 1, the Bible says, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the, bar uh, the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffer him not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to sing praises to your name and to look at this particular passage. And I do pray today that each person in here would be able to leave with something practical and tangible that they can, they can use in their lives, that they understand the principle in the passage of shaking off the vipers that can attach themselves to us in this life. I also pray if there's somebody here today that is not saved, that they will put their faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. Now, Acts chapter 28, I, I want to just share with you a little bit of a background so you understand the context. So here we end up on an island, and Paul's with 275 other sailors. So to understand Acts 28, 1 through 5, you've got to understand a little bit of Acts chapter number 27. So the Apostle Paul was being sent to Rome to stand before Caesar because if you remember, he had already shared his testimony in Acts 24 before Felix, Acts 25 before Festus, Acts 26 before Agrippa. He appealed to Caesar. He's going through the Mediterranean. He's on his way to stand trial. And that's what's going on. He's got 275 others on the ship with him when they land in the island of Malta. And that's kind of the modern term. It says Malita in the text, which is known today in modern terms as Malta. Matter of fact, I'll show you just a little picture behind me is this is uh, the current place of where the ship landed some 2,000 years ago. The bay where this took place is known today as St. Paul's Bay. And so Sicily, so you have the, the, the boot of Italy there, you've got uh, right behind me, you'll see down below southeast of Italy is where this particular island is located. And here's Paul. Paul's on a ship. The ship is caught in a storm. God had already told him that the ship was going to be saved or excuse me, that the passengers were going to be saved. And he was told that in a dream that he conveyed that with those particular sailors. And 275 of them on their way. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're Clyden. The storm comes and they're in a grave danger. And everybody on that ship thought they were going to die. But Paul, because Paul had been already shown by God, listen, the ship may suffer loss, but the, the folks on the ship are not going to die. Now, when the survivors land on this island, they're met by some very friendly natives. You see in verse number two, it says the, the, the uh, uh, barbarous people that were there. And it says that they were entreated by them and shown great 
hospitality. Now, the reason I'm giving you a little bit of background of this particular story is so you understand what happened prior and how they ended up on this particular island. Matter of fact, uh, you can still visit Malta today and witness some of the appreciation that the uh, people there on that island showed the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, there's a ship, a church there called Paul's Shipwreck Church that you can go visit today as they honored the Apostle Paul and his journey there on this particular island. Now, on a practical note, what is it that I want to just very simply convey to you today that we can learn from the passage, the principle out of Acts chapter number 28, and that is this. Paul was bitten by a viper, fastened on him. He shook it off. And that is really what I want to convey to you today is that there's many vipers in this life They're going to fasten themselves on you and you need to learn to do the best you can to shake it off. Now, I'm not going to say that in a very nonchalant way. Oh yeah, well, just shake it off. Just don't, hey, get over it. You know, I know you were, you were hurt or you were mistreated or, or there's some bitterness there. Just get, no, no, no. I'm not saying it in a cavalier way. I'm saying it in a way that hopefully you'll grasp and understand the importance. Not easy but it needs to be done because otherwise it's going to stay attached to you and it's going to define you. And that is not, trust me, that is not what you want. Notice in your notes, if you would, just this first simple thought here, and that is this, uh, we need to learn to shake off your unexpected challenges. That's our first thought. Shake off unexpected challenges. No doubt when this took place, it was a total shock to the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine? You're gathering a bunch of sticks and, uh, and, and getting them ready to throw them on the fire. And all of a sudden a viper comes out and fastens itself on you, a poisonous snake. And obviously that, that can have some effect on you. And by, by the way, two things stand out in that passage I think we should consider. Number one, the, the, the crisis itself happened while Paul was doing something good. So don't miss that. Just think... Just think that just because you do something good or you're involved in something good doesn't mean that something bad can't happen. So we learn that. The second thing that we think we learn from this passage, and it's so important, is this. That our service for God does not exempt us from a trial or a hardship. Just because you're saved, if you're saved, doesn't mean that you're not going to have a trial or a, a challenge come your way. You know, if you study your Bible, you'll see Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, there was, there was Jesus explaining to individuals. He said there was a wise man and there was a foolish man, right? And it says that the rain fell and they were building their houses. And the rain came on both houses. And the floods came to both houses. And the winds came to both houses. But the only difference between those two particular houses were what? The foundation. One was built on a rock and the other was built on the sand. I hope this morning your foundation is built on the rock of Jesus Christ. So when you see the situation here, all of a sudden, Paul's doing good. He's gathering some sticks. He's throwing them on the fire. And by the way, that typifies Paul's not a lazy preacher. He's not. Here he is. He's cold. He's wet. He just gets to the island. They're making a fire. What's Paul doing? He's getting some wood. And so he does it. And out from that fire, a viper comes and fastens himself onto Paul's arm. And the Bible says... Paul shook it off. Many believe our faithful service to the Lord is some kind of a shield against trouble in their lives. Tell tell that to Job. Job, the Bible says he was perfect, he was upright, he feared God, and he eschewed evil. Tell that to Job. Tell that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown in the fire. Tell that to Daniel, the one who purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat, who was thrown in the lion's den for doing good. And tell that to Elijah. Tell that to Jesus Christ who knew no sin that went to the cross. So 
We have to understand in life, in life, troubles are a reality. Uh, just consider Job 14 in verse 1. Man that is born of a few days old is full of troubles. Jesus said in John 16 and verse 33, he said this, in the world you shall have tribulation. Did, did it say might have? It says shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When troubles come, they can derail our faith. They can kind of knock you out. And by the way, by the way, by the way, it'll really derail you. It'll really knock you out of the race and, and get you sidetracked if you, if you all of a sudden think, wait a minute, wait a minute. This happened to me, God. I'm saved. I'm serving you. How did this happen? And all of a sudden, bitterness towards God can come because you don't understand that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Don't ever let that happen to you. In times of trouble, we have great and precious promises. Don't forget, even when you're in a valley, even when you're in a storm, you have the promise of his presence. Hebrews 13, 5, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. You have the promise of the victory that's guaranteed to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. You have the promise of his purpose. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt all things are going to work together for good. You have the promise of his power. Ephesians 3 makes it clear he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. When challenges come our way, we have two basic choices. Two basic choices. You can allow the challenge to control you and define you, or you can shake it off. Just for, I know this is a, a little bit of a base illustration, but I'm going to have a little fun with this and pull out some friendly creatures. Now, just, just I know it's a, a, a very base uh, elementary illustration, but I'm going to show you with a visual illustration the best I can to be able to show you what I've observed in not just almost 20 years of ministry, but in my own life and in dealing with people. I have found in life that many people have allowed a viper to fasten themselves on their, they haven't shaken it off, and it's on them, and they don't shake it off, and eventually, don't miss this, it controls them. It defines who they are. Matter of fact, some people wear it as a badge of honor. In life, there's many different kinds of vipers that can come your way. You can have the, just the simple viper of worry. Some people here, this one is, a, this one is the worry viper. Uh, that's what they do, they worry. You say, well, that's not a big deal. No, it can absolutely destroy you if all you do is worry. Matter of fact, worry is, worrying is a sin if you allow it and you obsess over it. Worry says that God is dead. And if he's alive, he's incapable of handling my situation. And then there's the worry of fear. There's the, the viper of fear. Man, I got a lot of vipers here. And, and this one's fear. People fear about what could happen, what might happen. What does the future hold? When, when the Bible says in first, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But here's the issue and here's my point. In life, there are unforeseen circumstances, unexpected challenges that can come your way or ones that you've created yourself. And you say, well, how do you know that in life sometimes it, it defines people? Because inevitably, inevitably, when you talk to them, it will come up. It will come up. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so it comes out of the heart. Some people, this one here is your past, okay? Or this one's bitterness, this one's bitterness. I'll, get to, I'll go to this one. Bitterness. And it's in it because it, and bitterness is something that can actually really get so inside of you. The Bible says a root of bitterness because it starts out small. It can grow up. And listen, and the Bible says it can defile your body. Bitterness can actually affect your health. It really can because you have not been able to let it go. And then bitterness can affect those around you. It can, and, but, but here's the deal. If you do what Paul did, it was, the viper of bitterness fastens. If you shake it off and you learn how to get the victory over it. And by the way, I'm going to show you how. I'm not just going to tell you to shake it off. That's why I'm trying to preface this. Not in a cavalier way, shake it off. It's going to take work. It's got to be done. 
bitterness. How about this one here? This one is your past. This is your past. Some of you are allowing your past to define you. You have not been able to let go of your past. Jesus has forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven. They're in the deepest part of the sea. They're as far as the east is from the west. But you haven't forgiven yourself. You have not been able to forgive yourself. And the next time the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future, amen? Now, this is another one here that, that really gets people. You have our past, you have worry, you have fear, and you have bitterness. Now here's my point, real, real simple point. Paul, it says in verse two in your Bible, in Acts chapter two, the viper came out, fastened itself on Paul's arm, and he shook it off. Now he shook it off. He had no idea that that viper was gonna come out. Can you imagine how you would have responded? The thing about, the thing about challenges, that come our way, some of them are things that we brought on ourselves, and others are things that you cannot control. And if anything I've learned in time, when, when a viper comes, when a challenge comes, when a trial comes, sometimes it is not, it is not so much the trial. Don't miss this. It's how we handle the trial. Amen. Paul never overreacted. See, when I was growing up, I had a problem, my dad tried to teach me, but I, I had a hard time not overreacting to things. Any of you have the ability to take something really small and make it really big? Because that's me. I have the ability to take, a, that's why they have the term, a mountain out of a molehill. That's me. When I was growing up, I remember one time my grandma, my grandma, she had a, uh, she was making my brother and I cookies. And sure enough, she was making the dough and the blender caught her, caught her fingers. And she let us, me and my brother, know. All I remember about that day was looking at her fingers caught in the blender and panicking, and I ran up and down the hallway screaming. That's how I handled it. <laughs> Believe it or not, for those of you that know my brother, he was the sober one, and he called and said, hey, uh, we need to get a... a the ambulance here, the fire truck here, the fire truck came out, they cut off the thing, cut off the, the blenders, not, they didn't cut her fingers off, they cut the blender off, took her to the hospital, did surgery, had stitches, so on. But, but I remember vividly handling it completely wrong. And it was out of my control, it just something happened. But I remember one that was in my control, I tried to do the best I can to handle, in my mind, a, a challenge that came my way. I was working for Costco years ago and I was driving a truck for the corporate offices. And I'll never forget this one particular day. I was getting gas down on, off of First Avenue and I, it was a freezing cold day and just nasty out. And I got out of the truck and I you know, took the handle, put it in, got in my truck and I went to read my Bible and it was just a hectic day and I was busy and I was behind schedule, and I was done getting gas. I realized what time it was. I headed out, I'm on my way, driving down First Avenue, and I, I see this girl next to me kind of trying to get my attention, and I said, I'm a, I'm a married man. Why is she flirting with me? <laughs> and I looked in my review mirror, and I realized that the nozzle was stuck dragging the cord down First Avenue. I had pulled out of the gas station and yanked the cord out of the, are you following me? So, I don't tell everybody that. It took me a long time. I feel so much better. Thank you for letting me share that with you. I went into the, to the office there, and, or the little uh, area, and I told the guy, I said, listen, I apologize. I said, I'm an idiot. Here's what I did. And I told him, he goes, well, there's a release mechanism on those for guys just like you. And uh, I said, thank you. You made me feel so much better. I tell you that to say this, that was kind of, I had to learn to shake that off or it was gonna affect my whole day. And Paul in this situation had a viper jump on him and guess what? He handled it exactly how you're supposed to handle it. He never overreacted. How would you respond if a viper fastened onto your arm 
And, and by the way, can I say vipers come in many different ways? There's a book that I've, I've read a couple of times. I actually encourage you to get this book. It's, it's titled Well-Intentioned Dragons. It's, it's out of print, but you can still get it used. And it's, a, it's called Well-Intentioned Dragons. Very, very good book. And in life, you find there are many times where each and every one of us have to learn the importance of when, whether it's a well-intentioned dragon, whether it's a viper, fasten itself on you, that you learn to shake it off. Don't let unforeseen circumstances define you. Don't wear your past as a badge of honor. Don't wear, the, don't wear it on you where you can't shake it off, where it's something you've never got the victory over of, because the older you get, the harder it will become to shake it off, and it will define you. So and I know I'm, I'm not just saying it in a cavalier way. You've got to learn how to do it, and I'm going to give you the remedy here in just a moment. Notice number two, if you would quickly, shake off the criticism that is thrown your way. Acts chapter 28, look at verse number four. Notice what it says, Acts 28 verse four. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom the, though he escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffer him not to live. Soon as Paul was bitten by the snake, the people of the island began to criticize him. They, they were very suspicious people and they assumed that the viper bought, bit him because of some evil that he had done. In their view, Paul was a wicked man. In their mind, uh, Neptune, the god of the, of the sea, did not get them. So uh, Nemesis, the god of dispensing justice, would get them, would get Paul. And so that was their mindset. That's what they were thinking. Uh, let, me, let me just say this when it comes to Paul being criticized. May we learn to be very careful before we criticize people and say things to people. Because, uh, I wonder, well, I know why this happened to them. That's because they did this or they deserved that because they did. Let's just be very, we don't know what God is doing. We have to be very careful about uh, doing things like that or we can really hurt those around us. I, I've seen people say, well, they're just being judged because people are often quick to criticize. Have you ever been the, have you ever been the subject of criticism? Yeah. I, I know I have. Uh, you're not alone. Israel criticized Moses from everything from being hungry and tired and thirsty. Even Jesus Christ himself faced criticism. They said that he was in a league with Satan. They, they said he was a blasphemer. But don't let criticism define you. Don't let it define you. There are times, by the way, when you and I deserve criticism. Consider the source of your critic. You know, it was, it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Brother Gary. Charles Haddon Spurgeon made this statement. Don't miss it. He said, believe half of your critics and half of your praise. I'll say it again so you kind of get it. Believe only half your critics, but believe only half of the praise. And that's important to note. Uh, I, remember, I remember years ago, my wife and I, uh, we were on vacation. We, we did a, a cruise, and we were in, uh, I believe it was uh, Mexico. And I had contacted the cruise place ahead of time, and I said, you know, I'm uh, a pastor of a local church just north of Seattle, and I want to let you know that if you don't happen to have a minister on the ship, I'd be honored to conduct the service. And so when we got to the ship, the uh, director of the ship met with my wife and I, and, and they said, that'd be great if you want to hold the service. We don't have anybody that is, that is uh, here to do it. We'll put it in the, they call it the ship news, and we'll, we'll push it underneath the doors, and so, you know, they get it every night and let people know. They couldn't hold it in the, uh, in the chapel on the ship. There was too many people that came, so they ended up holding it in the lounge. Some, nothing like preaching in a bar, but we did. And so we had service, and it was great. We had loads of people show up. We had, uh, I preached the gospel. We had some professions of faith, and we had a great time. Well, later on, uh, after the service was over, I had a bunch of people shaking hands. They all got together and said, well, Pastor Murphy, they said, you know, listen, do you think on the sea days you'd be willing to hold a Bible study? And I was like, 
Mary's like, yeah, do it, do it, do it. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do a Bible study. I'm thinking, great. Now I'm putting together lessons that I didn't bring so we can have a Bible study. But anyway, so a couple of days into the, uh, into the trip, uh, it's a C day, and uh, I have the scheduled Bible study, and we're meeting in the chapel. And I said, well, Mary, I said, it's time to go to the, time to go to the, uh, the Bible study. And she says, you know, I think I'm going to pass. You go ahead and go. <laughs> I'm like, you're the one that told me to do this. Anyway, so I went, and I'll never forget, the reason I'm telling you this is that it, when it comes to believing half of your critics and half of the praise, I'll never forget one lady came to me after the third C day in a Bible study. She came to me, she goes, she was from South Carolina, and she said, Pastor Murphy, would you come to South Carolina and be our preacher? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, you love me now. But if I'm preaching against any of your sin or any of this, I'm going to be, you're going to stab me in the back later. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying where I am. And I didn't tell, I didn't tell her that. I just, in my mind, oh, God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> believe half of your critics and only half of your praise. And there are people who pride themselves on their frankness. You ever met anybody like that? Well, bless God, I just tell it like it is. You know, it's my candor. I'm just very candid. I just, I just say it. Well, be very careful. Oh, I just give them a piece of my mind. Be very careful. Sometimes there may not be very much there to give. And <laughs> I just give people a piece of my mind. Listen, Dr. Shemish preached a message years ago, and I'll never forget it. Actually, it was not even years ago. I think it was last year. And it was, spoil not their resting place. And it was out of Proverbs, and Proverbs says this in Proverbs 24, verse 15. It says this, listen. Lay not wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not their resting place. Do you know sometimes when you just throw a comment at somebody, and maybe you just say something to somebody, and just maybe either you say, well, that's just my personality, or that's just... You have to be very careful. And we've all done it. We've all made the mistake. But I'm trying to just remind you to be very careful of what you say to people because words carry weight. That's why the Bible says, let your words be few. Okay? He that holdeth his peace is counted wise. So there's something to be said about that when you land something on somebody else. What you do when you do that is you're spoiling their resting place. They're going home and they're thinking about what you said. And um, it's, not, it's not a healthy thing to do. So what? So what do you do? What do you do? What, what should I do in the face of criticism? Well, if you're Paul, you shake it off. If you're Moses or Joshua, you continually faithfully lead your people. If you're Jesus, you go to the cross and die for your critics. And that's what you do. But if you're wise, you'll consider the source of the critic. And if you're discerning, You'll get your eyes off of your critics and you'll get them on Jesus. Now, if you came to me and you said, Pastor Murphy, I have been criticized. Or I, I'm going to go back just back to my initial point. I, I've got a viper that has attached itself to me. It's a bitterness. It's maybe it's an unforeseen circumstance that just came out of nowhere. Maybe it's something I just can't stop worrying. Or... You can't let go of your past. It's just still there. Or it's a critic that just keeps, it might be a family member, it could be a friend, and they're just, they're cynics, and they're criticizing you. And you say, I, I just can't get the victory over it. And you came to me, you'd say, and, and what would I tell you to do? What would my remedy be? Well, my remedy, and I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm going to tell you the way that I try to do it, and I emphasize the word try, and I think you can do it too. The Bible says in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, and you guys, many of you know the passage. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then it says this, Consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Here's your answer. Looking unto Jesus, the author and what? 
finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on things down here. If you were to say to me, what do I do? You want to shake it off? Get your eyes on Jesus. Get it off your past. Get it off the bitterness. Get it off the worry. And give it to God. And folk literally do the best you can. Focus on him. Some of you are sitting here today and you've got something that has fastened itself on you and you haven't been able to let it go. You haven't been able to do what Paul did and just shake it off. It might be your past. It might be bitterness. It might be a critic. It might be something. God knows what it is. I know this. God told me to preach this message. So whoever it is in the last service or in this service, it's somebody that's here today. You need to learn to shake it off. Thirdly and lastly, notice, shake off the fickleness of others around you. Would you look at Acts 28? You're in this passage. We didn't turn anywhere else. I want you to see this. I have to, I laugh every time I read it. I'm going to laugh again. It's hilarious. Look at, so look at verse five. He shook off the beast into the what? And he felt how much harm? How be it? Look at, look, at, look at the people on the island. They just criticized him for being a wicked man and a murderer. They looked upon him and, and as though he had swollen or fallen down. They thought the viper was going to kill him. Thought he should have fallen down dead. Suddenly, look at this. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's hilarious. You've got to admit that's so revealing to human nature. This man's wicked. Oh, the, the sea didn't get him, Brother Jones. The sea didn't get him, but the viper got him. That's what happened. This is the God of nemesis that dispenses justice. They got him. Oh, wait a second. He didn't die. He, oh, my goodness. He's, not a, he's a God. That is the pure definition of fickleness. Just kind of wishy-washy. And then, let, me, in fact, let me read you real, real quick the definition of fickle. Marked by a lack of steadfastness, constancy, stability, given to erratic changeableness. Is it okay to say we're living in a day that is full of fickle people? They're fickle. You can see it in sports. The quarterback's the greatest guy on the team until the next game when he threw three interceptions. Trade him! MVP, MVP, MVP. Just like we looked at two weeks ago with Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Oh, crucify him a week later. The Bible gives you many examples of this all throughout the scriptures. Can I say to Open Door Baptist Church this morning, no one but you determines the quality and the length of your service for God. There's not a critic or a cynic or a crisis that can drive you from him unless you allow it. That's the key. You have to understand. We allow it. When I start getting discouraged, because my if I were to, I didn't label my own. I didn't put mine on here because I didn't want to preach to myself too much. But mine would be discouragement. Sometimes I just get discouraged. And I try to shake it off. And it won't go. And, I'm, and I, oh, I got the victory over it. Now it's back. And I can't shake it off. What is it? Just sometimes you just get discouraged. You want to reach people for Christ. You give your life to the gospel. You're set for the defense of the gospel. You pray. You prepare. You preach. You want to make an impact for Jesus Christ. And sometimes you just get a little bit discouraged. And I have to... <laughs> where'd it go? I didn't even, that wasn't even in my notes and I didn't do that last service. Maybe I'm not discouraged anymore, right? <laughs> God just gave me the victory, amen. Open Door Baptist Church, can I encourage you today? Learn the best you can how to shake off the vipers. I might not even have touched on the one that's fastened you. You may be sitting here and you're just, you're okay. But God knows and you know there's one that's fastened to your arm right now that you're dealing with, maybe at work, maybe a health issue, maybe a family situation, maybe a relationship, but it's a viper and it's still attached to you. Paul shook it off. 
may we learn the principle by looking unto Jesus and do the best we can to shake it off. I said to my son the other day, he runs track and field. He used to be on the local high school golf team and he didn't like the coach, so now he's running. You say, well, who's his coach? I'm his coach. And uh, anyway, he's a runner. And uh, so I say to him sometimes, you know, uh, how did your meet go or how did this go? And I'm always there rooting him on, but how do you feel about it? And there's times where if he didn't meet the uh, time he wanted to meet or get the place he wanted to get, he just, I said, just shake it off. He's like, I put so much into it and I try so hard. It's hard just to shake it off. And I understand that. But how many of you agree we can't dwell on defeat, right? Uh, yesterday he ran uh, the mile. He ran a 431 mile, which, you know, I can do, I can do a 431 as well. <laughs> 400. And he took second place. I was proud of him. 19 high schools, did great. You know what he wanted? First place. And guess what? That's good. You want to be driven that way. And sometimes defeat can drive us to success. I get it. But we can't allow the, the viper of defeat either to define who we are. Because ultimately, guess what? We're on the winning side. We have the victory. So don't allow the vipers to attack fasten themselves to you and allow them to bring you down. Please do the best you can to learn to shake it off. Let's pray together.